All right, welcome everybody. It's good to see everyone. I see a lot of people, a lot of familiar faces, some new faces too. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, so at this time, we're going to go right into tonight's lecture. Um, first, let me introduce our, our speaker for tonight. Um, I'm sure you all know him. He is Reverend Samuel Kim. He's the senior pastor of uh, Zion Church in Singapore. Um, and he is um, going to be delivering the message for us tonight. So before he comes to give us the message, I just want to ask all of you to just focus on the word that's being preached. Um, you know, your, your faces are all on Zoom now, or most of you are. So please concentrate on the word. Let's, let's be mature here. Uh, don't make faces. Don't do things like that, okay? Um, we're receiving God's word at this time. So without further ado, let me um, welcome Pastor Samuel Kim uh, to give us the message tonight. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Hi. Hear me okay? Yes. Yeah? Thumbs up? Okay. Uh, I'm asking because uh, since this morning, my mic hasn't been working properly. Uh, thank you, Pastor Andrew, for the introduction. Thank you, praise team, for such blessed praise time. And thank you, Bernard. Uh, ah, so good to see everyone, uh, although I cannot really see everyone here. And thank you, Pastor Andrew, for telling them not to make faces because I'm so nervous right now that uh, I might break down and cry if you make, start making faces. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know how this came about, but uh, it, it happened suddenly that uh, we are having a youth conference and youth and young adults conference. And I believe and, uh, that it is by God's providence and God's uh, plan that we are doing this and so i lift up uh this time uh unto into god's hands uh the topic that we have decided to share uh both uh, i and pastor andrew from both sessions we are going to share on uh colossians chapter 2 verses 6 through 8 with the topic uh theme uh see to it that no one takes you captive so i'm gonna See to it that no one takes you captive. Let us read the main passage first. Therefore, as you have, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Uh, we've been kind of locked down. We've been away. We've been uh, uh, limited by this COVID-19 pandemic. And, and I believe that this COVID-19 uh, has allowed most of us, if not all of us, to think about the end times and maybe the signs of the end times. What if this is the end? Because I thought in the beginning, to be honest, uh, this would be like SARS or, you know, swine flu that will just pass by, uh, just, a, just a little uh, uh, virus. But then it just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it seems like there's no end to it. Uh, hopefully there, it will come to an end. And it's much bigger and uh, scarier than I personally expected and thought. And uh, I started to think, what if this continues on to the end? Or if something, what if something bigger comes around? Uh, are we doomed? Are we, do we have to live the rest of our life with mask on? Uh, what, what's going to happen? And so I believe Pastor Andrew has covered at uh, his church uh, about the end times and the signs of the end times. I have shared at, at uh, Zion Church here. And uh, one of the most important signs of the end is the appearance of the beasts uh, in Revelation and uh, the influence of the philosophies and the ideas of the beasts. 
And though that is as scary in the spiritual aspect as the coronavirus. And uh, so I'm, we're hoping that this will be kind of like a vaccination for you guys, uh, for all of us, uh, so that we can be we can build up our immunity to the influences, philosophies, empty deception of this world that the beast is uh, influencing. So let us think about the influences of the Antichrist in the end, uh, in the end time. There is the beast, there are beasts that come up out of the sea and the land in Revelation, and they have the authority of the dragon. And dragon represents Satan, uh, the devil. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, it says, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And then skip to verses 3 through 6. It says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. And his fatal wound was healed. And so this beast had been uh, present before in this world, and he was slain. It was wounded, and it seems like it came back. And the whole, and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. So uh, at its second appearance, the whole earth is amazed, and the whole earth follows after the beast. And not only that, they worshiped the dragon because he, he gave his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast. So they, they start to worship the dragon. And please uh, do not think uh, literal dragon or literal beast. We're not talking about animals here. Uh, this is uh, Revelation is uh, written and read uh, with symbolic meanings and spiritual meanings. And so... Uh, it's speaking about an, uh, uh, an entity, a person or a country, or even uh, an entity with some kind of uh, teachings, philosophy. And people were saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? There was given him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. In today's main passage, it speaks about Do not be deceived by empty deception, empty words, right? And in the end, we see the beast with a lot of words. Uh, It speaks a lot, uh, talks a lot of different things. And it says, uh, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth and uh, in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle that is, those who dwell in heaven. Now, once he blasphemes against God, you would think that he would be judged or people would turn away from him. But then it continues on, uh, skipping to verse 11 through 14. Then I saw another, another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, like a lamb. So lamb represents Jesus, right? Uh, so this is, this is a being that has a, a shape or, or image of, of the lamb. Uh, and he, but he spoke as a dragon. So we need to learn to discern and, and understand whether that message is from the dragon or from Jesus. And uh, he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and he makes the earth and those who dwell on, the, uh, on it to worship the first beast. So this second beast is like a religious figure maybe, right? And causes people to worship the first beast, which was more of a secular uh, character and <clears throat> leader. The first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven into the earth in the presence of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given, which was given, which it, it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and had come to life. So uh, these are two beasts with the authority of the dragon, and one causes 
all men to all people to worship the other and they are deceiving and people think people follow probably thinking that this is this must be the lamb has the signs and miracles and all all the uh, requirements it seems so that's why the topic is see to it that no one takes you captive um just to warn you uh you probably have noticed uh from the screen uh, my lecture will not be so bright <laughs> it's quite uh we'll be swimming in the darkness uh but after this lecture after a group meeting you go to bed and wake up with a bright sun that will be shining from pastor andrew uh we decided i will share about the negative aspect and he will share about the positive aspect i don't know how positive it will be but uh so at the end of this whole conference you will end up hating me and loving him uh i really pray that that's not the case anyway let's go on so what about the influence of the beast uh what is that influence of the beast since when from when did this influence begin? Uh, can you, you, although I cannot hear you and I cannot see most of you right now, but uh, let's, let's work it out with, uh, together. You can kind of, uh, uh, think of think on your own also. Uh, when is the first time you see beast influencing mankind and God's children, God's people in the Bible? Let's go back all the way to Genesis, right? In the Garden of Eden, the one that deceived Adam and Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was Satan, but in the form of the serpent, right? A beast, right? So this influence of the beast had been around from the beginning, and it's been around, it's, it's still around us. So let us uh, take this first part, uh, second as a big number two, and briefly think about the times when the beast or influence of the beast, thoughts and ideas that led people to destruction in the Bible, to judgment. You can think of big, big incidents where people were judged or destroyed. First, let us think about Adam. What kind of thought was put into Adam by the serpent that caused him to fall away from God's word? What do you think? Remember what the serpent said to the woman? You will be like God, right? And so this seed of thoughts and ideas uh, that they can be like God, meaning you can challenge against God. You, can, you don't really need God. You can be in a, in a, on an equal level with God. So the idea is, I can be like God. Uh, you probably uh, uh, can probably already tell that uh, we're, where we are getting at. These are the thoughts that we have to be careful not to deceive us. Okay? I, can, I can be like God. I don't need God. You know, we would never say that as Christians. I hope we don't. But then sometimes we, in our lives, just kind of like when we tell our parents, leave me alone. Sometimes we have that kind of attitude toward God. We, we want God to kind of close his eyes, turn his back, or ignore me, leave me alone kind of thing. I don't want God, to, I don't want to be under God. We don't say that, but we say, I don't want to be under that kind of teaching or under the strict law uh, regulations of God, of the Bible, right? Let's go to the next one. Remember the Tower of Babel? God judged the people there. What's the idea behind it? Human effort to establish, to be established without God's help, with, without God's intercession. Or you might think, they might think, without God's interruption in my life. I will establish myself. Worshiping, I will do when I want, in the way that I want it. I will live my life. Don't get involved. Don't interfere. 
And at Mount Sinai, remember when the Israelites made the golden calf, uh, they were uh, they they were there at the bottom of the mountain, and Moses had been going up and down, right? And up to that point, which was, which was a sixth ascent, Moses went up and came down immediately. Maybe, maybe it took with uh, less than a day or at the most a day, right? But on this sixth, uh, sixth ascent, he was up there for 40 days. And people started to think, hey, he abandoned us. He ran away. And they said, uh, we need a God to lead us back to Egypt. Now, what they actually really wanted in their heart is coming out. They've been grumbling and they've been saying, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back. They have this great regret that they came out into the wilderness. Do you have regrets that you, have, you came into this wilderness, which is a church, which is life of faith? And sometimes you want to go back to the past where you used to enjoy Egypt. But that's a lie, too, because the Israelites, they were crying out because of the oppression in Egypt, right? But now they, they themselves are deceived in their own thoughts. And they're now saying, uh, this is horrible out here. We used to enjoy food. We used to enjoy our life back in Egypt. Bogus, right? Anyway, they wanted to go back. So they gathered up what they had, the, the gold and the jewelry, and then they made a golden calf. Going back to, it's the worshiping, the gold, worshiping of the golden calf, relying on the traditions of the Gentile world, the ways that Egypt used to do it, creating and following something that will replace God. There are many, many things that, replaces, that tries to replace God, that people use to replace God in this world today. And so whenever there's a chance, Satan is trying to cause us to go back to the easier ways of the world, the, the ways that the whole world approves of or Egypt approves of. And it feels like what I'm doing, following Moses or following God, is a crazy thing. And so thoughts and things that cause us to think that believing in God, following this word, is a crazy thing. It's a very minority thing to do. And you want to follow the majority. You, know, you want to follow the trends of this world. And they probably knew that they made the golden calf. How can that be God? But then that's what everybody else did. And then they come to the plains of Moab. Remember what happened at the plains of Moab? Uh, we're not going to get, get, get into details of these stories, but this was the camp right before they entered into the land of Canaan. They were there. They made it, almost made it. And then there were seductions and temptations, right? And they fell in. It began with eating began from eating, satisfying their greedy desires and fleshly desires, which led to idolatry and eventually led to sexual immorality. Again, some of the things that we are faced with, uh, the temptations that come to us. And they started saying, hey, food, what's wrong with eating this food, right? But then they suck you in, little by little. At first, it, they make it sound like it's not a problem. It's just a little thing. You deserve to enjoy it. You've been walking around for 40 years. You deserve to enjoy a, one good meal, no? And so, let, but then that food was given to the idols first. And so in order to eat that food, you have to go through the ritual first. And then that ritual involves... Uh, sexual activities, and so on. And so, and then uh, the exile. We'll skip all the way to the, the Babylonian captivity, Babylonian exile. Why were the Israelites uh, destroyed by Babylon, a Gentile nation? 
did God not protect them? And why did God allow the Israelites to be judged that way? Uh, because I mentioned idolatry and sexual immorality earlier, uh, I did not write it here, but then according to the book of Ezekiel, they were worshiping idols and they were doing all these promiscuity things, promiscuous things uh, in the temple, temple of God, where worship was supposed to be conducted in holiness. They brought in defilement. They brought in sinful things. They were worshiping idols while, while they were in the temple. People who are supposed to be serving in the temple were worshiping idols. That's why the glory of God departed from the temple. And God is explaining through Ezekiel, this is why you are in captivity right now. And, and uh, in 2 Chronicles, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all these prophets are t- telling us people were more focused on, their, on earning money. Malachi also says that earning money and focused on their own, own work and own gain more than worshiping God, their priorities. And so worship of God became an accessory. It became not only an accessory, it became a side thing, extra thing, and then it became a burden. Money before faith, my thing, my business before God's work. And so these are the ideas, these are the philosophies or baselines of their, uh, what, what lay as baseline for their life, uh, base of their life, foundations of their life, and their, their ways of thinking that caused the destruction. So then are those influences still around? What's your answer? I'm not the only one living in this world. You're living in this world too. And you are probably uh, more, uh, you know, out out in the front lines uh, of these temptations and hardships, right? We pastors are hidden behind these churches and we don't know what the world is like. (laughs) But you guys face it day by day, right? Are those influences still around? Oh, yes. Yeah, big yes, right? How? In what form? The main idea that supports the beast is atheism. What the beast has been doing, and the common thing about these uh, events that we saw in the Bible just now, common thing is that they want to negate God from their life. They want to prioritize something else. God became a burden, burden something. And so... Uh, the, one of the reasons why I chose to share about this, uh, I think uh, one of the Hora uh, conferences I shared about atheism also. Um, Reverend Abraham Park, our founding pastor, uh, he was teaching about um, the thoughts and the, the ideologies, philosophies of Satan. And he said, atheism and communism Think, uh, these are uh, these seem like just another ism, another idea, another philosophy in this world. But these all root all, all the way down, uh, all the way back to the serpent's idea, the ideology, the the ideas and temptations and the thoughts that the beast is uh, injecting into mankind is shown in the form of atheism and communism these days. And so that's what caused, uh, uh, made me uh, curious because, you know, communism is not mentioned in the Bible and how can it be, uh, you know, compared to the ideas presented in the Bible? Isn't communism a modern thing or you know it's it's uh, started by Karl Marx uh, Marxism and all that how can it how can you relate correlate uh, things of the Bible uh, to the ideas of the world right now 
But uh, as I was, that's why we went through these uh, these thoughts and ideas that cause destruction in people, and especially in, in the people of God. And uh, Ephesians chapter five verses six through twelve, it says, "Let no let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them." For you are formerly darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. So I pray that uh, you and I, all, all of us, will become, uh, we, I believe that we are the children of light. And so let us live as the children of light. So what are these uh, thoughts and ideas? I'm going to think about, uh, share with you. Please bear with me as we go through these philosophical ideas and explanations. Uh, yeah, please stay awake. It's morning time here, so I'm awake, but you guys are nighttime. Uh, but anyway, uh, atheism, Marxism, and from Marxism come socialism and communism and even uh, fascism and Nazism, things like that. The, the great evils of this world, right? Uh, why do I put atheism next to, next to it? Uh, because I believe that is also related. I'll explain. This philosophy, these philosophies destroyed many people's lives and many countries in the history of mankind. All the countries that were uh, hardcore communists, communists, they have perished. The communist countries right now, they are not fully communist right now. They follow, they, this, this uh, philosophy involves uh, much of the economics, so I'm, but I'm not going to get into all that. But it coincides with the ways of Satan described in the Bible, as I mentioned earlier. So how do these atheistic beliefs influence people? We'll talk about just one aspect, materialism. Atheism and communism, uh, again, communism comes from Marxism. Uh, it's a violent form of communism uh, put into action. Uh, through a revolution and so on. But um, atheism and communism claim that all things that exist are matter and thus denies the existence of the spiritual world. Everything is limited to matter. Uh, the Bible tells us that all things are created by God who is spirit. And the Bible speaks about the spiritual world, which is the kingdom of heaven, as more real than this world, right? But these beliefs deny the existence of God altogether because God is spirit. He's not, he doesn't, he is not matter, right? And to them, he doesn't matter. <laughs> Genesis chapter one, verse three, then God said, let there be light. We know, right? Hebrews chapter 11, verse three also, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. God is the creator. Same thing with John chapter 1, verse 3. All things came into being through him, which is the word and Christ. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world. The world was made through him. Same thing in Psalm 33, verse 9. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So, but what is the problem with materialism? First, it views people as worthless matter. For it argues that even mind and heart come from matter and denies the existence of the spirit, of, of our spirit, soul. And so everything, they're trying to put everything and define everything as matter. Even our mind and heart come from matter, right? Uh, but these are, you can compare that idea to the biblical idea uh, with these Bible verses. Friedrich Engel, which, who co-formulated uh, Marxism with Marx, 
says, mind is a byproduct of matters and thus argued that there is no sanctity in man. He also said, in the beginning, man created God. Something wrong there, right? In the beginning, God created man, right? But it's a, he says, in the beginning, man created God. Mankind was considered a means or a tool used for the Communist Party. And so uh, they don't consider, the, they don't have, uh, give, ascribe any value to mankind. And so Mao Zedong, uh, uh, the great communist leader in China, killed. Oops. Sixty-three million people. Stalin killed forty-five million. Kim Il Sung, North Korea, uh, killed seven million, and on and on. They don't consider any value. They don't feel guilty about taking away people's lives. Second problem is that it claims that religion is opiate of the people. You know what opiate is, right? Atheism denies God's existence. Communism is not necessarily atheism, but it seeks to destroy God so that they can stand. They both claim that God is made up by the imagination of people. And you, you might think this is quite far-fetched from our beliefs, but then uh, surprisingly, it is quite close to us. Yeah. A lot of these thoughts in different forms come to us. How do you believe that the Bible is really true? How do you be believe, how do you prove the historicity, the, re the, how, the reliability of the Bible? Has anybody seen Jesus resurrect? I'm, I'm digging a deeper hole here. <laughs> uh, you know, the, these doubts can arise in our minds and people, uh, Satan is using those thoughts to cause us, make us move little by little towards the, uh, these doubts and eventually wants to cause us to think that God is made up by the imagination of people. Socialism also derives from Marxism, causes atheism. Socialism replaces Christian eschatology with a secular, secular narrative. They have a better story. It erodes both the adherents, religion, and society's liberty. We'll get, uh, please do not be too bored. Uh, we have some of these uh, philosophers and atheists and novelists. Aldous Huxley was a novelist who uh, argued for atheism and his contemporaries saw atheism's moral vacuum. When you have atheism, you, you don't have God, right? And so there's a moral vacuum as their instrument of liberation okay? because it allowed them to embrace sexual hedonism and socialism. So he explains the liber in his book, uh, the liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. This is what he explains, the reason why he prefers atheism. And he represents many or most of atheism, right? And because he inter it interfered, mor morality interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. And he further explained that atheists may be more inclined to accept comprehensive social economic ideologies as a substitute for faith. So Satan is creating all these thoughts that would substitute for our faith and always tempting us. Can you exchange this? Secularists embrace absurd doctrines like communism or fascism, he wrote, to satisfy their hunger for meaning. They're looking for some kind of meaning of, in their life. And the reason why Marxism and communism 
is still quite very powerful in this world is because it's an idea. It's not just a system, it's not just a, a, a revolution or an event. It's a philosophy. It's a very well-made human philosophy. And ideologically or, or, or philosophically, it's very ideological. In practice, it's horrible. But it, it just in theory, it's, it, it's the greatest ideology. So they are trying to use this to find meaning in their life. Dotson Rader, a uh, one-time revolutionary, I think in the United States, uh, he said, you have, to, you have to change the conscience of people. You've got to change people's sexual attitudes, people's attitude toward the church, people's attitude toward education, toward business. And that is happening right now in our time. He admitted that drug use, sexual promiscuity, and sexual deviancy is a device because they create, he says, natural allies to a revolutionary movement against religious beliefs. We're almost done with these uh, quotes. Whitaker Chambers, who was uh, espionage, a uh, double spy uh, between Soviet Union back then, uh, during the Cold War times uh, and U.S., and he uh, basically came back to U.S. and gave up uh, communism, and then uh, he started to write and, and report and he called communism the second oldest faith. The promise whispered in the first days of the creation under the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall be as gods. Marxism promotes the vision of man as the central figure of the creation. So what, what's behind the agenda behind these movements and communism and Marxism, socialism, is to upholds human beings. So initially it feels good because they try to make you the main character, just like the serpent did to the woman. You will be like God. Because all of a sudden God is out of the picture and you become the center of the picture. Humans will be the superhumans. They will be, they will be the leaders. They will be the center. And so not because God made man in his image, but because man's mind makes him the most intelligent of the animals. So communism restores man to his, not God's, but man's sovereignty by denying God. Communist revolution, Chambers wrote, like all great revolutions occur in human, uh, man's mind before it takes form in man's acts, as socialism makes inroads among America's young people. It replaces Christian eschatology with a secular narrative. It supplants, supplants traditional morality with alternative ends and means for this life. Left unchecked, it erodes both the adher adherence, religion, and society's liberty. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So without, they will never label it Marxism, communism, socialism, or atheism. But whatever that, caught, that will cause apostasy, cause us to lose our faith, we need to be aware and we need to be careful. This is the word that uh, you've been waiting for and that gives, gives a smile on your face, conclusion. But those who are quite uh, aware of uh, me, conclusion is half point, 50% of the uh, study. In the world of atheism, uh, what God said in the Bible does not hold authority in the hearts of the people. And it does not become the basis of argument. So, uh, for example, you quote a Bible and you say, God said this. And they're going to say, who cares what God said? Right? It, take, it holds no, no more authority in this world. 
right? In the world of atheism. And they want to look at things from human perspective. And actually that sometimes sounds better to us. We are close because we are human beings. It, it's friendlier to us. Sympathetic to humanism. So their eventual goal is to make humankind into their own gods. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet. In the, in the book of Daniel, God shows the images of beasts and these idols, right? And then he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, is the idea or the ideas of the beast, the influence and philosophy of the beast standing in the most holy place today. When you see that happening, he says, let the reader understand. He says, the end is near. So what do we do? What's, what's, uh, I cannot just end this Bible study by introducing to you what Marxism and atheism are. Right? What are we to do? No matter what we do, Let's remember what Jesus said. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I thought this was just about uh, providing for us and you know, uh, making us rich or providing for our food. But, and, I, and then I thought, what, what can I do to uh, seek for his kingdom and righteousness? And I thought... Uh, a good way to, is to uh, evangelize and for me to do a lot of good things for the kingdom of God, for church. But then that's not what it actually means. It means when it says seek first his kingdom, he's saying make sure that you are in his kingdom first. You know, you can live our life. We can think whatever we want to think. It's okay. But I want to say, Make sure that you have assurance to enter into the kingdom of heaven first. If not, nothing else really matters, right? If you really believe that there is God, I hope you do. And whether you believe it or not, he is there, right? And what he says about heaven and hell, heaven and hell exist. Again, whether we believe it or not, heaven and hell exist. And the eternal punishment or eternal life, blessing, they also will take place, will happen. And so we need to be aware. We don't have the luxuries of saying, is this right? Do you agree with this? Do you agree with that? If we do not have assurance to enter into the kingdom of heaven first. So secure that first. Secure that his righteousness is in us first. So how do, we go, how do we receive the assurance of heaven? Do you have assurance of heaven? Ask yourself. Don't raise your hand. But ask yourself. Some of you, some of you might not have the assurance of salvation. If the world is to come to an end today, if I were to pass out and die, I heaven forbid, but uh, if I were to end my life today, will you be in heaven today? Or are you not sure? See, this assurance of salvation and going to heaven doesn't is not about my own conviction only. It's not about uh, having feeling guilty about something that I'm doing. And asking this pastor, that pastor, and this pastor says, no, you don't like this pastor. This pastor says, oh, it's okay. Then, oh, I can't go to heaven. It's not something that a human being can decide. It needs to be based upon the Bible, the truth of the Bible, the absolute truth of the Bible. And it needs to work with the 
the, the Holy Spirit needs to work in me. And through that word, through the Holy Spirit, we need to have that spiritual assurance. And I cannot tell, you cannot tell, even though I'm a pastor, you don't know whether I'm going to heaven or not. But I have that conviction and I need to go further than that com- my own conviction or my own thinking. I need to really have that assurance from the Bible that matches with my life and my thoughts, and also through the work of the Holy Spirit and through the blood of Jesus Christ. So what does the Bible say? Uh, Jesus came to, in his first coming, Jesus came to the Jews, right? And they thought they were the sons of God, right? They thought they had no doubt whatsoever that they can. They, they believed 100%. They are the chosen ones that will end up in heaven. All those Gentiles, they will fall and they will, they're, you know, uh, they will burn in, in hell. And so Jesus comes, and this is what they say. Uh, let's turn to John chapter 8, verse 41. John chapter 8, verse 41. You are doing the deeds of your father. This is what Jesus said. And then they replied to him. They said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. So they're saying, our father is God. We are the children of God. What does Jesus say? Let's continue on to verses 42 through 44. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth from and forth and have come from God. For I have not even... Come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. In verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. This was a very shocking thing. They thought it was a blasphemous thing, but they had no idea that they could not get into the kingdom of heaven. They thought they were the sons of God. And Jesus tells them the truth. You are actually sons of the devil. What do you do to them? See, my experience, my conviction, my faith, my my works, all those need to be compared and and, uh, be tested by the word of God. It's only God who decides, right? Whether we say it's fair or not, that's how it is. He's God. For God is God. We're human beings. Harsh truth, of course, he's not as mean as I present it to be. But uh, going going into heaven, the Bible speaks about it as receiving eternal life. And so the disciples of Jesus uh, were asking Jesus, Jesus, how do we receive eternal life? And this is Jesus' answer. John, John chapter 17, verse 3. We know this passage really well, right? This is eternal life, Jesus says, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So knowing God and Jesus is the way to go to heaven and eternal life. Now, let me ask you, do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Do you know and do, can you believe that Jesus died for us so we can go to heaven? Do you know it? Do you believe it? He says that knowing is eternal life, right? But then let me ask you another question. Does Satan, the devil, know God and know Jesus? Does Satan know that Jesus died on the cross to save us and give us life? James chapter 2 verse 19 tells us that Satan shudders, trembles before in knowing, in the knowledge of God. We don't even tremble. We don't even shake at the knowledge of God. But Satan... Is a, has reverence 
of the knowledge of God. He shudders. He's afraid. Right? He knows. Does that mean Satan will have eternal life or, or go into the kingdom of heaven? No, Satan belongs to hell, right? So then what's the difference between Satan's knowing and our knowing? It says ginosko. Ginosko is not just an idea. It's not just a, a knowledge or fact. It's not just agreement, not agreement in the knowledge. We need to ask ourselves, is my faith real? Is my knowledge real? Is your knowledge real? And what's the, what is the difference between Satan's knowledge of Jesus and God versus our knowledge of Jesus and God? See, we, we do all these things. We read the Bible, go to church religiously. And we comfort ourselves by saying, oh, I, I served in the church. I went to Sunday service. I did this. But then, is there really Jesus in, your, in our heart? Is it truly out of love? Or am I just hypnotizing myself, thinking I did it, so I, I, I can call myself Christian. I'm saved. See, ginosko is not just knowing fact, but it is the knowledge, knowledge that results in something. For example, if you knew the winning lottery number, what day is it over there? Uh, Friday. Is that Powerball Friday? I don't know. Mega, mega millions. Uh, if you know the winning lottery number to a $500 million lotto, what would you do right now? Would you be sitting here? Or would you be going to a market or liquor store to buy a lotto? See, when you have that true knowledge, it, it carries on into our action. And let's say that you got, you won that lottery and you find out and it becomes your knowledge. Will it stay as knowledge or will it come up? be transferred, translated into your action and reaction. See, true knowledge creates reaction. It's kind of like falling in love, right? Let's say you find out that the, the, the person that you've been, uh, you've liked, you find out that that person likes you back. What happens? Your heart starts to beat faster or, or some things. So there's some kind of chemistry happening, something, something that makes you happy, excited. Right? True knowledge of Jesus and God needs to result in fruition. And what is that? That is called obedience in the Bible. Obedience is something that we do because we cannot see the future. Kind of like a blind man being led by a, a person who can see. Right? Because he cannot see, he has to listen to the person who is leading him. When he says, step, there's a step, step up, he has to step up. If not, he'll fall. Because we don't see our future, because we don't know what's going to happen, obedience is our guide. Also, obedience is not, we're not just talking about blind obedience. Sometimes it is like Abraham's case, but then God prepares us and God gives us the word. And obedience is the word of God being fulfilled in my life. When God said in the beginning, let there be light and there was light, that is obedience. The power of God's word taking place and making, bearing fruit. When God says, it is. That's obedience. And so in, in the Gospel of John, in Hebrews, they continue to talk about faith, and then immediately it relates it to obedience and action. Of course, we're not talking about uh, salvation through our works or action, but we believe in salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. 
But if that faith is real, it needs to have some kind of result. It needs to bear fruit. So as reference, John chapter 5, verse 24, 1 John chapter, 1, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, John chapter 3, verse 36, and on and on. Hebrews chapter 3, 18 and 19, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. For example, Hebrews chapter 11 speaks about Noah. By faith, Noah right, was warned of the things that he did not see yet. Right? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and conviction of things not seen yet. Right? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. And Noah believed and built the ark. See, Hebrews chapter 11 goes in, in, in order of the forefathers of faith. And it says, by faith, they believed. And it talks about what they did as a result of their faith. For example, if God says to Noah, Noah, I'm going to judge the world with flood. I want you to build, it, build an ark. Oh, well, yes, I believe God. I'll build it. Build it. And the day before, or seven days before God is ready to send the flood, he comes, 70, 80 years later. He comes to Noah. God says, hey, Noah, where's the ark? Oh, um, I have the, the material ready. I have everything ready. But I just got really busy. Uh, I'll start as soon as I get a chance. What's, what would happen? What would have happened if Noah did not carry that faith into action? What if God tells Abraham, God, uh, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. Oh, God, uh, he's in college, but uh, can I wait until he finishes and he graduates first, and then, then I'll give, it to, give him to you? What's going to happen? So right now in this age, I believe the church and God needs people who can really believe him, who can overcome the temptations and deception of Satan. And think about what next generation church will be like. I'm not distrusting all of you guys, but some of you, or hopefully all of you need to be the ones that will carry on this war and maintain the church. I'm talking about this generation, right? And who's going to have the faith and the word and audacity to push forth? We have people like Steve Jobs and, you know, different people who thought forward, thought to the future and created all these uh, technology that we are appreciating, we're, we're taking advantage of. We need somebody like that in terms of church, in terms of the word, who can think ahead and use these technology, use, establish something that will protect this, this faith and that will spread this faith to this world. And I pray, and I believe that's one of the reasons why uh, Pastor Andrew and I and your pastors and many leaders are doing things like this. To be honest, uh, please don't uh, misunderstand, but to be honest, up until an hour ago, Pastor Andrew and I were saying, why did we even start this? I was shaking in nervousness and and we don't, we're like, well, what do we say to these people? And, and how do we lead these people? And it's, it's overwhelming. You guys are overwhelming because we believe that you are greater people than we are. And uh, it is such a great task, great, such a heavy thing because you are the next leaders. And we don't feel like we deserve and we have the ability to lead you guys or teach you guys anything. And so, of course, the, 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 the conclusion that uh, we came to is, let's leave it up to God. They are God's children. Let's leave it up to Father, right? But really, uh, I believe that God, uh, God is allowing us to have this kind of conference so that from these conferences will come out great leaders 
that will continue this faith, that will take the baton and run. Uh, we don't know when Jesus is returning. When, we don't know when our God is coming back. But until then, we cannot let go. We cannot uh, let Satan take control of us and our children. So I pray. Uh, I know the, the topic, has, uh, topic was very heavy, and it may not apply to us right now. But remember, these philosophies, these thoughts will come and tempt us, every one of us. So let us be on guard. Let us be alert and awake. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time, this conference, allowing us to think about the signs of the end time, how scary and, and fearful the, the work of the beast, the work of Satan is. But Father, we believe that you will protect your people. And Father, more than anything, allow us to have that assurance of the kingdom of heaven. Even if there's anybody, anyone who does not have that full assurance, may the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit work in them. Father, allow us to repent of our sinfulness. And Father, please draw close to us. We cannot come to you on our own. Just as Jesus came to save us, Father, we believe that you are coming to our hearts and our lives to save us and to forgive us and to bring us back to your bosom. So, Father, we pray for your guidance, your answer to all of their prayers. And every member who's listening, who's joining in this conference, we pray that you will never let go of them. Hold on to them, Father. Bless them and walk with them. Thank you so much for your grace. Believing that you will be with us throughout the, uh, this conference until the end. Please be with the group discussions and group uh, activities. May we receive your blessings and grace throughout the entire time. Thank you so much for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks to God.